Good morning. How are y'all? Good? I want you to continue to eat this morning. We're, we're, we're multitasking, and we're really good at that, so we're not even going to worry about it. Um, I do want to pray for our food this morning. Uh, Carrie was really funny. Can we turn the, the music off? Thank you, ladies. Um, she told me that her dad has this little thing that he does is before he prays, if they've already eaten, he says, bless the Lord, all my soul and all that is within me. <laughs> so, and I told her when she said that this morning, I said, I'm using that. And she goes, go ahead. So I had her permission to use that. Um, let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this whole entire semester, Lord. You've been so good. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Ezekiel's faithfulness. Lord, we pray that um, the food that was prepared this morning uh, will nourish our bodies and our minds. And we pray, Lord, a blessing on the people who prepared each dish. Lord, I pray this morning that your words will be spoken in this room and that they will glorify you alone. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. And other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to the plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. That is Psalm 126, and it is talking about the return of the exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem. We didn't get to hear the rest of the story, did we? Last week we ended with Ezekiel 39, 25, and 25 to 29. So now this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will end the captivity of my people. I will have mercy on all Israel, for I jealously guard my reputation. They will accept responsibility for their past shame and unfaithfulness after they come home to live in peace in their own land with no one to bother them. When I bring them home from the lands of their enemies, I will display my holiness among them for all the nations to see. Then my people will know that I am the Lord their God because I sent them away to exile and brought them home again. I will leave none of my people behind. And I will never again turn my face from them, for I will pour out my spirit upon the people of Israel. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. And then we get to verse 1 in chapter 40. On April 28th, during the 25th year of our captivity, 14 years after the fall of Jerusalem. After the fall of Jerusalem. That is about the year 573 B.C. It would be another 40 years before the first of three waves of exiles would begin to return to Jerusalem. I figured this morning we needed to have us a Paul Harvey moment. And now for the rest of the story, right? Does anybody remember that? I only remember hearing promos on the news. I never really listened to him, but I remember hearing those promos, and it was kind of the thing that you did as a joke to people. You would go, and now the rest of the story. Forty years more. Why? 
The number 40 holds great significance throughout the scriptures. The rain poured for 40 days over the ark while Noah and his family remained safe from the flood. Moses stayed away from Egypt for 40 years while God prepared him to become the deliverer of Israel. Jesus faced temptation in the wilderness for 40 days in preparation for his ministry. There are other examples where we encounter the number 40 and they all encompass similar themes. Purification, preparation, or fulfillment. Does that sound familiar to you? That's what our author wrote in the opening introduction to the book of Ezekiel. Because you just spent 40 days walking through Ezekiel. Eight weeks, five lessons a week. Forty years it would be before the first wave began. And during that time, God was preparing his people. He was purifying his people. And he was filling them up to obey. We see in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, the first wave. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, The Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judea to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem, and may your God be with you. Did you catch some of the words in there? All the kingdoms of the earth belong to me, um, Persia's king says. The Lord has appointed me to build him a temple And any of you exiled Jews who want to go back and do that, you are free to do so. I I found that humorous as I read it. As I read through that, I was like, does he not know that he is being used mightily by the Lord? And no, he did not. He did not know how God was using him mightily. In verse 5 of that same chapter, it says, Then God stirred the hearts of the priests and the Levites and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. The year was 538 B.C. And this was the first return to Judah to rebuild Jerusalem. And it began with the reconstruction of the temple. They were led by Zerubbabel, a descendant of David and an ancestor of Jesus Christ. Matthew 1.12 says, after the Babylonian exile, it is the genealogy. And it says this, after the Babylonian exile, Jehoiachin was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. His name probably means seed of Babylon. His Persian name was Shezbazir. That's it. That's it. We'll just call him Shez, okay? This suggested that he might have been in the service of the king. Yet Zerubbabel left all the comforts of Babylon behind. It was a small remnant of 42,000 people accompanied by 73,000 or 7,300 slaves. 
why wouldn't the opportunity to return to the promised land cause a massive exodus from Babylon? One of the commentaries I read, it said the Jewish people were full and active members of the Babylonian society. They were not slaves. They were full and active members of society. And many of them prospered. It's easy to imagine that many second and third generation Jewish Babylonians had no interest in leaving. The promised land held no interest for them. There were, however, men and women like Zerubbabel who turned their backs on the comforts of a pagan world and turned their faces toward the God of Israel and the land he promised he would give them and would be theirs forever. And the first order of business in Jerusalem was to rebuild the temple because the primary lesson for these exiles was to put the Lord first in all things. I found it interesting that it said it was easy for them to remember, for them to not turn their backs on the comfort. One of the things the Lord has just been pushing at me the whole time is I really like to be comfortable. I'm going to say that again. I really like to be comfortable. I like comfortable shoes, comfortable pants, comfortable dresses. I have a collection of dresses in the summertime that I call the three C's. They're my three C dresses. They're cool, cute, comfortable. And then one year I added the fourth C, cheap. Um, (laughs) They had to be cool, cute, and comfortable. That was a prerequisite before I would buy it. I touch fabric in stores. If it's not soft, I move on. I don't care how cute it is, hanging on the hanger, I move on. I like to be comfortable. I like comfortable conversations with people. I like comfortable company. It was interesting, while we were in Dallas, there were two breakout sessions that I looked at and went, oh no, I'm not going to those. Those those titles make me uncomfortable. And immediately, God snatched me and he went, that's your problem. You like to be comfortable. And so I went to both of them. And I was uncomfortable. But I went to both of them. And I learned so much. And God was so good. And now it's making me excited to step outside of my comfort zone just a little bit. Once you stick your foot into that, your toes into that, it gets a little easier. So our first wave has made their way back to Jerusalem. About 80 years later, a second group returned under the priestly leadership of Ezra. Ezra 7, 8 through 10 says that Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in August of that year. And that year was 445 B.C. He had arranged to leave Babylon on April 8th, the first day of the new year, and arrived at Jerusalem August 4th, for the gracious hand of his God was on him. This was because Ezra was determined to study and obey the law of the Lord and to teach those decrees and regulations to the people of Israel. And finally, Nehemiah returned with the third wave of exiles. A few years ago, we, we studied Nehemiah. And these verses in the first chapter, in late autumn, in the month of Kislev, 
in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Hananiah, one of my brothers, came to visit me and some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked him about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well. For those who returned to the province of Judah, they are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem had been torn down and the gates had been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days, I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. For days, I sat and mourned and grieved and fasted. Nehemiah would go to the king, for he was his cupbearer, and ask permission to go back to Jerusalem. And the Lord's hand was on King Artaxerxes, and he made him favorable to those requests. And Nehemiah returned to rebuild the walls and to rehang the gates. He encountered a lot of opposition from their enemies that were surrounding because they wanted to be in charge. And here comes Nehemiah, and he's taking the leadership. In 52 days, as determined as he was, in 52 days, after years of the exiles who had returned were living in the debris with the with the gates down, with the walls down, in 52 days, this determined man, because God put a desire in his heart, rebuilt the walls and hung the gates. 52 days. He had a singleness of purpose. He sought divine blessing. And he gave thanks to God for all of his success. Then with the help of Ezra and later the prophet Malachi, Nehemiah encouraged spiritual reform. In Nehemiah 8.1, it says, In October, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square, Inside the water gate, they asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. The people, men, women, children, all of those old enough to understand, stood and listened closely as Ezra read aloud the law. I just want you to close your eyes for a minute and think about that. This is the first time that the people of Israel have stood in Jerusalem and heard the word of the Lord read aloud. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the joy? Can you imagine the grief? They worshiped. They bowed down. They praised. They wept. And they mourned. But the priest reminded them that this was not a time for mourning. This was a time for celebrating It was a time to celebrate that they had heard the words of God and they understood them. It's revival. They were experiencing God's revival. But, there's always that but in there. 
some of them are good when we say, by God. And some of them are not so good. Time brought with it a return to life. Life got in the way. Jobs got in the way. Cooking dinner got in the way. Disciplining our children gets in the way. Entertaining our friends gets in the way. I'm just going to give you a little summary of what Nehemiah writes in chapter 13. He discovered that the Levites had not been given their prescribed portions of food. In those days, he saw the men of Judah treading out their wine presses on the Sabbath. They were also bringing in grain, loading it on donkeys, and bringing their wine, grapes, figs, and all sorts of produce to Jerusalem to sell on the Sabbath. Some of the men from Tyra who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise. They were selling it on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem at that. So I confronted the nobles of Judah. Why are you profaning the Sabbath in this evil way? Wasn't it just this sort of thing that your ancestors did that caused our God to bring all this trouble upon us and our city? Now you are bringing even more wrath upon Israel by permitting the Sabbath to be desecrated in this way. Things had returned to normal, as we like to say. They had returned to life that was recognizable for them. I love this quote from Eugene Peterson that he writes in the introduction to the book of Malachi. It says, during the humdrum times, when things are, as they tend to say, normal, our interest in God is crowded to the margins. And we become preoccupied with self. We treat the worship of God as a mere hobby or diversion. Managing our personal affairs for our own convenience and disregarding what God has to say about them. Going about our usual activities as if God were not involved in such dailiness. Does that resonate with any of us? Resonates with me. Remember, I like to be comfortable. The Babylonian exiles returning to the land of their fathers marked the last rays of the declining sun of prophecy with Malachi to set it. And then for 400 years, God's people lived without a prophetic word from him. But God had a remnant Remember, Carissa talked about how important it was to have the remnant. If God hadn't preserved that remnant, they would have just been absorbed into other countries, into other nations, and they would have totally disappeared. But God had this remnant. And during those 400 years, all along, the faithful remnant were praying that he would fulfill his longstanding promise of salvation through his Messiah. Then suddenly, this is what the commentary said, then suddenly God broke into history. I'm thinking, really? Suddenly? It's been 400 years. That is not suddenly. I I just want to get them and go, I would like to redefine the word suddenly for you because that is not suddenly. Then suddenly God broke into history and announced what he was about to do. In the birth of John the Baptist. You see, God often waits until the times are dark and hopeless before he sends revival. 
Luke 1 records God breaking into history with the greatest revival ever. The coming of the Savior into this world. Luke 8. One day Zechariah was serving in the temple for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a crowd stood outside praying the faithful prayers of the people. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him, but the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children. And he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. John the Baptist was coming to announce the birth of Jesus. In the meantime, Elizabeth is visiting with Mary. And at the sound of Mary's voice, the baby in Elizabeth's womb jumped for joy. We're getting ready to celebrate Christmas. I cannot think of a better year for us to be doing that after coming off of this study of Ezekiel. Are you in a place that you're ready to jump for joy? After John the Baptist was born, Zachariah got his voice back because if you remember the story, he um, kind of made the angel a little mad. And the angel said, you know what, just for that, I'm just going to close your mouth and you're not going to be able to talk until this baby is born. And when the baby was born, the first thing he said is his name is John. And then he prophesied about Jesus. And he says this in verses 68 to 70. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. True revival is when the living God sovereignly and powerfully breaks into human history with the good news of his salvation. I'm going to say that again because that's a good one. True revival is when the living God sovereignly and powerfully breaks into human history with the good news of his salvation. Yes, amen. Bible.org puts it this way. It invariably begins with his people coming under deep conviction of sin and turning from that sin in a genuine repentance. It always involves the recovery of biblical truth about how sinners are reconciled to a holy God. Jesus, born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And on the third day, 
Queen of Rose. There are no more beautiful words than John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Colossians 1, 19 and 20 says this. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. The best news for us is that Christ did not leave us alone. In John... 14, Jesus says this in the upper room. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now. And later, he will be in you. And in chapter 16, verse 5, But now I'm going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you're grieved because of what I've told you. But in fact, it's best for you that I go away, because I, if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do not go away, then I will send him, if I do go away, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. If you drop down to verse 13, it says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. When I focus on the reality of all God provided in fulfilling the promise that Jesus made, to send his Holy Spirit, my response is overwhelming gratefulness. Next semester, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the Trinity, how the Trinity works together, and what the Trinity is for us, so that we have a better understanding of that. Spend a lot of time in the Holy Sp talking about the Holy Spirit. We have been blessed with the presence of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit brings forth fruit in our lives. He intercedes for us when we don't know how to pray. He teaches us the things of God. He is the source of our faith. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says that no one can come to Jesus. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. He empowers us to do the work that God has called us to. Acts 1, 8. Oh, don't we love that. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We laughed about this when we were doing Acts. Because I can imagine the disciples standing there and going, okay, Jerusalem. I want Jerusalem. Okay, maybe Judea. That might be okay. But oh, Lord, please don't send me to Samaria. 
And oh, what in the world is the end of the earth? But the Holy Spirit would empower them to do just that. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there's that word again, there was a sound from heaven like the roar of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them abilities. The Holy Spirit empowers us to know God, to believe God, and to understand that he alone is God. Isaiah 43.10 says just that. But you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed nor will there be one after. In Christ, by the Spirit, we see Ezekiel 36, 26, and 28 fulfilled. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. And you will live in Israel, the land I gave your ancestors long ago. You will be my people, and I will be your God. How many promises have we seen God fulfill over the last nine weeks? We are blessed to know, believe, and trust our God. Then you will know that I am the Lord are words that have become very precious to me. I hope they've become precious to you. How many times have we written it? Do you want me to tell you? 40. We've written it 40 times. Maybe a little more. Because every day, every lesson, that question we had to answer, what would they know? Then they would know that I am the Lord. Okay, so now it's your turn. I would love for you to share where you have seen revival, how you have seen revival, what you have learned about revival this semester. This is a time for us to encourage one another. I've already told you mine. God is moving me out of my comfort zone. One of the things we heard in Dallas was how bold every speaker was. They said things that kind of rubbed you the wrong way, but they spoke truth. And they were not afraid to do so. They were not afraid to step out of their comfort zone. And I want, to do, I want to be that way. I want to be that way that I speak the truth in love, a truth that may not always be comfortable. So that's where God has me right now. Where does he have you where revival is?